Yes, it is. Good morning. Can you hear me? <laughs> Good morning. It is a real pleasure to welcome you to the oldest publicly funded institution of higher education in our state, Central Connecticut State University, or CCSU. Today, we are excited about starting a new academic year, unlike any other. Yes, we are welcoming our new and returning students in the middle of a pandemic that has turned our lives upside down. CCSU has a long history of success. For more than 170 years, we have been educating the working class of our state, and we are ready to continue to do so despite the COVID-19 pandemic. As it is our tradition, we will be providing an enriching educational experience to our students while the health and safety of our central family guided the preparations for this semester. During the summer, we developed a comprehensive plan for a successful fall 2020 semester. We have invested millions of dollars in technology and infrastructure upgrades to contain the coronavirus spread and also enhance online and on-ground learning. We are quite proud of our new high-flex classrooms, which are equipped with some of the industry's most advanced classroom technology. You are welcome to tour our facilities and see firsthand the transformation to keep our students, faculty, and staff safe and healthy. And now, I would like to invite pres the president of the Connecticut State Colleges and Universities System and a state lead for reopening higher education, Marco Jakin, to share some remarks with us. Thank you, and again, welcome. Welcome to Central. Uh, thank you, President Toro, for your introduction uh, and for the great work you and your team have done here uh, putting together a comprehensive plan to repopulate uh, Central's campus. Uh, I first want to start by welcoming back all of the students, faculty, and staff uh, to all of our campuses for a very different semester. Uh, it has taken a great deal of work for all of us to be here today. Um, as a matter of fact, the effort to reopen all of higher education began in earnest in April, uh, right after we had to pivot to online in March, and a great deal of effort has gone into uh, making our campuses uh, ready and safe for all of our campus uh, community. Um, at the direction of the governor, uh, Connecticut has not only a set of common sense guidelines driven by public health to reopen all of Connecticut's higher education institutions this fall. Uh, but I'm happy to report that for the system I am honored to lead, at least for the next four months, um, the four state universities, the 12 community colleges, and charter Oak, we have a comprehensive plan to reopen safely. And today, on the first day of classes here at Central and at our public, and co public colleges and universities across the state, except for, as you know, Western, which had to put, push the pause button because of a temporary spike in cases in uh, Danbury, we are hopeful about getting both campuses up and running and reopening that university um, shortly, but we're ready to serve all of our students. And we know that 
this is going to be a very different semester, not only for students, but for employees and staff as well. As you can tell, there'll be fewer folks on campus and fewer in-person classes. There will be more online, hybrid, and high-flex offerings. Many appointments with student-facing services will be held virtually. Everyone on our campuses will be required to wear masks and keep physical distance. Residential students who are required to submit a negative test before returning to campus will be tested on an ongoing basis throughout the semester. Cleaning has been increased to keep classrooms and common areas as safe as possible. And these are only a few of the public health protocols that are taking place across all of our campuses. And I am confident that these moves, which are guided by science and public health data, if followed correctly, can ensure a safe semester at our public institutions of higher education. But that's the key point. Everyone on our campuses must be part of the solution. We must take the public health guidance seriously if we want to have a successful semester. This is, of course, a challenging time for all higher education institutions in Connecticut. And I'm going to have a few words to say later about the governor. Uh, but now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, my colleague in public higher education I'm um, in the state of Connecticut, the president of the University of Connecticut, uh, President Tom Casaleas. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, President Toro, for your hospitality. It's a pleasure to be with all of you here today. UConn has been partnering with the state, the governor, our commissioner on public health who's here, Deirdre Gifford, on establishing and following gating conditions for a safe return to campus for all of our campuses. And we're very fortunate to be in the state of Connecticut, to have the governor's leadership, and to really have a starting point that puts us at an advantage relative to our peer institutions. Our reentry plan is designed to protect faculty, staff, and students at all of our campuses, the surrounding community, and the state. To that end, uh, we are opening with a much lower density. As many of you know, we'll have about 5,000 out of our 12,000 beds in our dormitories filled. And on our campuses, our classrooms will be about one-third of the density they normally are in order to keep, keep six feet of spacing, uh, have masks on everyone, including the faculty and the students. All 5,000 uh, residential students who moved in last weekend or weekend before last uh, were tested on arrival. Out-of-state students from hotspot states were actually pre-tested, tested on arrival, and then again three days later. Of the arriving students, we had eight positives out of 5,000, so far below the positivity rate for the state as a whole. We're also testing all commuters and staff, and that's uh, ongoing and going very well. We are working very hard, and our faculty, staff, and students are working very hard. Um, compliance overall has been extremely good. Uh, when you walk around the store's campus, for example, you see almost every student uh, walking around with a mask on and maintaining social distance. Uh, there are key days, ahead, key days ahead, however. Um, we we um, have been very successful up until now. We do have one cluster uh, which has formed from, from the athletics department. 
And it's at this point, it is still below uh, the state average overall in terms of uh, the positivity rate on the campus. But uh, you know, our, our efforts are focused on containing that. And there'll be key days ahead to see how successful we can be. But our goal and our commitment is to stay safe, stay well, so we can stay open. And I'm looking forward to working with, with all of our partners uh, to, to achieve that goal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, President Casaleas. Uh, we would not be here today reopening all of our uh, institutions of higher education uh, were it not for, in part, the incredible work uh, done by public health experts in the, in the state of Connecticut, um, and especially by our great commissioner of public health, who has been a true partner um, in this entire effort. And so now it's my pleasure to ask Commissioner Gifford uh, to come up and say a few words. Commissioner? Thank you very much. President Ojekian, thank you very much. President Toro, President Casaleas, uh, Governor. Uh, and to the students, faculty, and staff, uh, here at Central, welcome back. And we're, uh, all of us at the Department of Public Health are wishing you a successful and, of course, a healthy semester. As President Ojekian mentioned, uh, the Department of Public Health in Connecticut has partnered very closely with colleges and universities uh, to provide recommendations as they develop their reopening strategies. There's a very long list of things that we have discussed, many of which you um, have just heard about, uh, but they're all very important elements to a safe and successful reopening. Um, I'll mention a few. First of all, uh, the, the quarantine of students returning to residential uh, uh, facilities from hotspot states. That was um, a, a challenging logistical uh, effort to put in place. I want to congratulate and thank all the colleges and universities and all of their staff at the residential facilities who figured out a way uh, to bring these uh, students back safely from uh, some of these states to get them tested, to make sure that they were in pods, and uh, make sure that they were not bringing any infections with them when they came uh, from other states. Um, President Ojekian mentioned the testing of residential students um, prior to arrival to make sure that there was a safe reentry to, to dorms. Uh, the colleges and universities have worked hard on developing isolation and quarantine spaces so that as soon as um, an infection is identified, that student can be uh, quickly removed from the other students and safely uh, kept apart so as not to spread the infection. Um, the dining facilities have been rethought. There's less in-person dining, there's a lot of grab-and-go dining, and the facilities are complying with uh, the governor's sector rules on dining. Um, so that's another important element. And then uh, contact tracing and working with local health departments. DPH has been facilitating some of those conversations. I want to thank our local health departments who've been working closely with colleges and universities to make sure that they're ready if, if, if a case is identified to make sure that they can do the contact tracing and notifying individuals uh, to, be, to remain safe. Uh, so, of course, we have seen cases uh, at, co at colleges and universities around the country. Uh, DPH is following those situations closely and communicating with our, our colleagues here in Connecticut. And we will make changes to our recommendations uh, and follow the science if needed. Um, that's what we did in Danbury, and I want to, uh, to give a shout out to the local officials in Danbury, to our colleagues. Um, at uh, the colleges and universities who quickly took action to slow down the repopulation of those dorms until such time as that uh, the peak of that outbreak in Danbury has passed. 
Um, so uh, the last thing I'll say is that we, uh, it, we're starting to see a pattern um, about social gatherings and spread of COVID. And these are often not the big parties, uh, although those are obviously problematic, but small social gatherings, just a few people um, maybe getting comfortable because of their friends or maybe even family that they don't live with. So I want to just say to President Ojekian's point about this is really the success of a return to campus really does depend on um, people remembering the, the rules about mask wearing and social distancing. Keep those social gatherings safe. Um, wear a mask with, uh, when you're around anybody you don't live with. Have your social gathering outside. Stay six feet apart. And if we all work together and follow these rules, we also are confident in a successful return to campus. And finally, I want to give a shout out to the team that's uh, keeping us safe by cleaning off the, the area in between. We really appreciate it. We appreciate all you're doing to make the uh, return to campus safe. Thank you. Thank you, the com uh, Commissioner. I think one of the key points the Commissioner made is that this is going to be a very fluid semester and a very we may need to be flexible in how we react to certain uh, circumstances and we are ready working with our partners in the administration to make sure that everybody remains uh, healthy and safe um, on our campus. As we all know, this has been an incredibly challenging uh, five or six months uh, for the state of Connecticut. But because of the governor's strong leadership, we have a comprehensive statewide plan to mitigate the spread of the virus while ensuring that essential functions restart. And the governor has not bowed to pressure from different sectors in our state who might want to reopen quicker than might be prudent according to public health guidelines. The governor has kept us safe. He is reopening the state of Connecticut in a very phased in and strategic way. And his leadership really should be applauded um, as we, I believe, have one of the lowest, if not the lowest, um, uh, virus um, positivity rates um, in the country. And so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the governor of the state of Connecticut, Governor Ned Lamont. Hey, well, thank you, uh, OJ. And um, President Toro, it's great to be back again. It's, uh, I'm, you know, I taught here for many years as an adjunct professor, and then thanks to President Toro, I became a distinguished professor, which I think is a three-syllable word for old. But uh, I, loved, uh, I love coming back, and I love the fact that uh, CCSU is coming back, and all of our colleges are coming back and coming back safely. Um, I gave OJ and Tom and a few folks a call right at the height of the pandemic. This was some months ago. You were talking about OJ. And I said, we have one of the great university systems in the world. And we got to figure out how we can start thinking about getting people back to school safely. And at that point, COVID was raging. And we thought maybe it was a little premature and uh, we got a guy named uh, Rick Levin, who is president of a relatively well-known um, residential college and uh, also a Coursera, a leading um, uh, digital distance learning um, university, along with Tomcat and OJ and, and the public health officials and saying, how can we do this safely? We started planning on that in, um, in April and May. And this is the culmination of um, some months of real collaboration between the educators, the teachers, uh, the public health officials, uh, trying to find how we do this. And President Toro, I don't think education will ever be the same again for, um, for what we're going through now. And we're finding the new ways that um, IT is going to be integrated into our classroom. And, you know, I, I spent the first 30 years before I was doing all this political stuff building telecommunication systems for colleges. And uh, so I, I can't say we anticipated this, but uh, what we were doing was um, trying to make, make sure this before the Internet, the, via satellite, we could bring the world to a campus. And, um, and this is just one more 
idea of how we're doing this and what you described in terms of your flex classes so that uh, those kids can go online or in the classroom. They have some of that flexibility. Tom is doing the same thing. We're doing that, I think, at all of our colleges and our community colleges as well. And, I'll, you know, I'll be blunt. Um, there's been a lot of anxiety about getting back to school. It involves our kids. Uh, it's a front line. It touches all of us. We're grandparents, parents, children, uh, you know, K through 8, K through 12. I've, ha I've had an awful lot of feedback there. And I'll tell you something, uh, to be blunt, all the public health people I I've talked to said, look, I feel very confident about K through 5, K through 8. Um, I, I look around the world and I see they've been able to do that safely. And frankly, they've told me, I think that's safer to be in that classroom, um, you know, five days a week rather than hybrid if you're in second grade, just so you keep that cohort limited, just those 24 kids, and you don't have daycare and lots of other pods that can uh, cross infect. You know, high school, we've uh, thought carefully about that, and that's going to be uh, much more hybrid, I think, as you look around the uh, state and what we've seen around uh, uh, the world. You know, a little more risk just because you're not as likely to be in that pod, not as likely to be in that cohort, but uh, we're doing that, we're doing that safely and allowing people to uh, have that mix, a little more like the flex we've got here at uh, C CSU. And um, I've talked to Tom and OJ, you know, I've, I've, we thought hard about colleges, because colleges are a little more complex. Uh, colleges, you're not just uh, getting uh, K through 8 students from a, a region that has a 1% positivity rate, as uh, God bless Connecticut still does, but you're uh, attracting students from 40 different states and 40 different countries in many cases, and a much higher um, positivity. And um, they're often uh, mixing and matching uh, as they in, in and around classes. Uh, so we really wanted to be focused on how we can do that safely. And as, um, you know, Marco Jenkins said, and man, we're going to miss you, <laughs> um, we really need everybody, especially at the university level, collaborating. You know, what you've been able to do in terms of um, the air filtration systems we were just talking about and the ultraviolet and getting the filters on there, what we've been able to do in terms of making sure that the young people are all wearing the masks even though they're invincible, no, not sure they really have to. Uh, right now, it's working. I mean, Tom has tested whatever it is, 5,000 plus students, and they have a positivity rate that is uh, lower than Connecticut and lower than it is around the world. And we've got to keep it that way. And I, um, I can't keep it that way unless the students understand what's expected of them. Uh, and I spent a lot of time talking to the students, and I've looked around the country, and I've seen those flare-ups at some of those other campuses, and I've seen those uh, frat parties, and I've seen some uh, kids who are a little bit uh, casual. And uh, well, look, I don't want to be uh, Governor Killjoy, <laughs> and uh, and that was not my nickname when I was in college. <laughs> but I also know um, we're going to have to work hard to keep our colleges open safely. And, uh, you know, O.J. said we're looking around the region. We saw what was happening in Danbury. Danbury, things spiked up to 7 percent, and we're putting public health first. That's what we're going to do. We're going to do that at every level of our uh, society here in, in Connecticut. And uh, we closed uh, down Western and um, the community college there at least for two or three weeks, and we get a better handle on where we are. And that's something I've got to remind students and teachers and administrators and parents. Uh, we are leading with public health. And um, if, I think if you get a chance to tour around CCSU, you get a chance to see um, the work that um, Tom and OJ and all of our uh, community colleges have been doing, seeing how seriously they're taking, I think you'll have a great deal of confidence that uh, we're doing it right. It's not. Sorry, guys, nothing is 100 percent safe. I wish I could tell you we're going to wait until we're 100 percent and your kids will never get back to school. But we're doing everything we can to make it as safe as humanly possible. And if the metrics change and we find out it's not working, just like at Western, we know how to change course. But I want to end on a happy note, President Toro. This is the first day of school. Uh, you know, I was at um, Bethel yesterday, going to the elementary and the high schools there, um, d different demographic. They're opening up uh, full time, especially for the younger grades. And uh, I was going through the high school, though, and uh, we were, it was first day, and the freshmen were walking through. And the level of excitement for these kids who have been isolated at home, not um, 
you know, doing a little Zoom learning. I don't, I don't know how much. Uh, just the excitement they had to be able to get back with their peers in a classroom, looking at a teacher. Uh, these folks, um, you know, I don't know what you've done, but they, they got six tenths. So they're ready to go. They're going to take advantage of September and October. And those kids are going to be outside, uh, you know, for outdoor classes some of the time, getting a mask break. I was interested in Bethel that, um, you know, they had a summer school that was pretty successful. I don't know, 100 kids or something, all ages. Um, and it worked well. And the younger kids and kids with disabilities were wearing the mask. And that gave teachers and parents, not to mention, um, you know, the kids confidence that we can do it right. And we're going to do it right, right here, right now. We got the team to do it. OJ, we've been planning for this for a long time. And I'm happy to say it's finally come. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. As the Governor mentioned, this whole effort to reopen higher education um, has really involved cooperation and collaboration by all institutions in the state of Connecticut. Um, and we would not be. Um, the state we are without the incredible opportunities that our independent institutions of higher education um, offers to uh, Connecticut residents. And so here representing uh, the independent institutions in Connecticut is uh, my colleague and friend, uh, President Rona Free of the University of St. Joseph. Well, thank you, President Ojekun. On behalf of the 15 independent colleges in the Connecticut Conference of Independent Colleges and our 70,000 students, I thank Governor Lamont and his administration for prioritizing the reopening of higher education and for putting together a strong team that issued comprehensive guidelines months ago so that we could welcome back students this fall. Whether learning remotely, in person or through a combination of formats, reopening our campuses makes it possible for students to pursue their educational and career goals and ensure that employers will have access to the well-prepared workforce that they need. Procedures and protocols at all of our campuses are aimed at reducing risk. We are one of the only states in the country that is mandating both a pre-arrival negative test for all residential students and ongoing surveillance testing. All of our campuses quarantine students for 14 days if they come from areas with a high prevalence of COVID-19 to limit the risk to our local communities where numbers of positive cases thankfully remain low. The State Department of Public Health has been a great partner to campuses in planning for mandatory contact tracing. Every CCIC campus has strict mask and social distancing policies as well as limits on student gatherings that are already being rigorously enforced. We have prioritized student compliance with public health guidelines which we know and students know will be the key to our success. USJ's Student Government Association President sent a letter to me yesterday requesting strict enforcement of policies because, as he said, we don't want to have to go home. Faculty have made tremendous efforts to redesign courses so that if students aren't able to come to campus because of health concerns or having children at home now, they can continue coursework remotely. This will be a memorable semester, but as a result of flexibility from faculty, commitment and creativity from students, and good guidance from the state, it can be a very successful one. Again, on behalf of all of the CCIC students and institutions, thank you, Governor Lamont. Thank you, thank you, Rona. As the governor, governor mentioned, we have incredible community colleges here in the state of Connecticut, um, which are also poised, I believe today classes are starting as well, to open up um, to, to students, but also are gonna be the economic engine that helps in the economic uh, recovery um, of our state following this pandemic. And here representing uh, the community colleges 
Chief Executive Officer of Capital Community College, uh, Duncan Harris. Duncan. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, who knew on, on March 12th when we closed our campus at, at 10 o'clock uh, that, that this is where we would be today? Uh, my uh, faculty scrambled. Many of my faculty actually work in, in Hartford hospitals. We have one of the largest nursing programs in the state. You know, we donated all of our PPE. Uh, Hartford has been, uh, certainly at the early stages, was disproportionately impacted by the virus uh, and the impact on our urban communities. Many of my students are essential workers, and we look at the living density in Hartford, et cetera, and so we were, were dramatically impacted you know, at the onset. Uh, my faculty were in the midst of going into spring break at the time, and so what they did was they canceled whatever their plans were and made arrangements to ensure that our students could complete their learning upon their return after spring break. On March 20th, I had a, a cough and a fever and it felt very different than anything I had experienced before. I was sick from the 20th through the 29th of March, and I was fortunate enough uh, to have a good friend, Dr. Reginald Eady from Trinity Health, who I was able to, to contact, and he was able to get me in to get tested on March 30th. At the time, uh, uh, I was at the, the tail end of, of having the virus, and so uh, needless to say that, that experience has informed the way in which I've gone about ensuring the, the safety of my faculty, staff, and students at Capital Community College. We immediately formed a, a broad campus committee to figure out our plan. Uh, all of the, the community colleges and and four year institutions in our CSEU uh, system met every Tuesday to review uh, plans and, and our connecting links with the Department of Public Health to formulate a plan. At the heart of our plan, of our 387 courses this fall, 85% will be fully online. And so our, our faculty uh, were able to uh, identify their preferred modality of instruction. That remaining 15%, some of it is uh, dictated by the, the particular discipline. And so our, our nurses or paramedic program or our radiological technology have stipulations that uh, uh, require them to meet on ground. Technology uh, is an issue for many of my students. So thanks to the generosity of our foundations, the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving, our college foundation, they, they uh, rallied and provided funding so that our students could, could uh, acquire uh, computers. And we had micro grants uh, that for students that were having challenges based on losing employment. Otis Elevator gave us a, a number of laptops this, this summer that will be distributed to students this fall. And so today I feel that our campus is ready. You know, we spent all summer uh, ensuring that plans are in place. You may be familiar with Capital Community Colleges as the former G. Fox building. It's 300,000 square feet, but it's 11 stories vertical. All students entering the building will not get to the elevators without a mask on. Everybody coming in and out of the building will sign in and out so that when we work with the Department of Public Health, we can initiate contact tracing. But as has been mentioned earlier, I think that a lot of this is, is the culture uh, that has been reinforced and led by our governor in the state of Connecticut. And that certainly holds true for our students at Capitol. Our average age is 28. And so uh, I feel somewhat fortunate to not have dorms uh, with uh, in local parentis and then other issues that folks must address. And my students recognize that, that them adhering and complying with all the requirements that many times their family is at risk should they not. And so we're in a very unique situation at our community colleges. And then I'll conclude by uh, uh, referring to what the governor mentioned about getting education back online in his comments earlier. And what I, I know about our community our college students, some 50,000 of them, is that they, many of them cannot afford literally and figuratively 
to not continue their education and pursue their, their degrees, right? And so we're very aware of that, but what we were able to accomplish this summer and as we open up today is to ensure that that's done safely. And so I just wanted to thank everybody and I feel, have the utmost confidence that we'll be able to ensure that those dreams are met. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Duncan. Uh, we're, we're very uh, fortunate today to have uh, two state representatives um, who represent parts of New Britain uh, here with us today. And first, I'd like to call on Representative Bobby Sanchez uh, to say a couple of words this morning, or af afternoon, sorry. Thank you. It's afternoon already, huh? <laughs> um, well, we all know this pandemic has caused all kinds of havoc <laughs> throughout this country and the state. But we have had some tremendous leadership from our governor. And the work that he has done has kept the positivity rates here in the state of Connecticut very, very low. And the work of his staff to the, department, the different departments like TPH. And, um, and even the, department of, uh, the State Department of um, Education, I'm the chair of the education, one of the co-chairs of the education committee. And I've been, um, I've never seen so many Zoom meetings in my life. And I hope that we can go back to normal e eventually, but um, being in contact with so many people throughout the state and um, listening to all their concerns and talking to parents, um, there's a high level of anxiety about how kids are going to return back to school. And I tell them that if you look at what's happening with our child care and our home care um, programs throughout the state, the positivity rates have been very little to none. And so they're doing, a, they're doing an outstanding job. And I'm hoping that our students um, at this level um, in college, um, you know, pay attention to the rules and follow these um, simple rules of wearing a mask and keeping a distance because we don't want to see a spike in COVID here in the state of Connecticut. We're doing an outstanding job, as we, as we all know, um, and it's because of the leadership of our governor. And I, you know, I'd like to thank you, Governor. Um, it's, it's just been outstanding and compared to all the other states. Um, so I'm hoping that sooner or later this will go away. Um, we're getting there. Um, hopefully by next year, early next year. Um, but, um, you know, there's a lot of parents, a lot of students that are eager to get back to, norm, to, to normal, normalcy. And most of the students that I've spoken to do want to return to school. They want to go back to school. Now their parents, on the other hand, <laughs> are still very worried, and I, and I, and I get it. Because um, as a parent myself, I'm worried too. But my son already graduated from this university uh, three years ago, Dr. Tarl, and um, great university. And so um, we'll see what happens. And we're going to keep in touch with our students, keep in touch with our parents, and um, reach out. Um, the other thing that we've seen um, that's of concern is, um, and it's been there, it's the many inequities that we have in education. Um, and especially in the urban center. And so I know that eventually we'll be able to sit down with the governor and his team to talk about those inequities. And um, here in the city of New Britain, we had close to, we had almost a thousand children that went without laptops um, and Chromebooks after March and weren't be able to connect. But now, um, almost every one of those students um, will have a laptop or a Chromebook to start the school year. So that's very important. And, and connecting to the internet was also another issue. But we have been doing um, some really good work here in um, the city of New Britain to put up hotspots for these kids to connect. So we're hoping for the best um, in, the, in the weeks to come. And we're hoping that the positivity rates um, stay very low so that we can continue throughout the school year. Um, and I'll leave it up to, um, I, I, you want me to introduce my, my colleague? Sure. And I'd like to introduce my colleague, Dr. William Pettit. I call him doctor, not representative, because that's what he is, a doctor. <laughs>
specialist. <laughs> yep, I am. Subspecialization everywhere you go. <laughs> one for the microphone, one for the desk. Uh, thank you, Governor, for inviting me today. Thank you, President Toro, for having us at Davidson Hall, the easiest place to find on campus. I've been, been lost here many times over the past four years. Um, most of, uh, you've heard most of what has been said, and I'm keeping, I'm between you and, you and lunch. Uh, I would reiterate the issues. I think that's what we're going to allow us to be successful, be it at universities, uh, undergraduate, uh, I'm sorry, uh, elementary schools, et cetera, will be the, the masks, the social distancing, and, and being outside. And I think Dr. Uh, Gifford reinforced that. And the only other thing I, th I thought I would bring up is, uh, and maybe you're all aware, I'm speaking to the, the media who lives and breathes this every day. Uh, this is only the second time in my lifetime where we're looking at a, a medical issue and it's evolving in real time. The first one was HIV AIDS. But, you know, going back to the early 80s, that, that evolved over weeks and months. We didn't have the internet, and we looked for the MMWR report every week when it came out, and, th and that was the, the update. But now we get updates every couple hours, and uh, it's certainly constituents and the general public gets confused because someone throws out a paper that says uh, this works, but it's, it's an uncontrolled study with a small number of people that are poorly defined. But they take it as gospel because everyone wants to grasp at something that's hopeful. So I, I always have to remind my constituents and people that the knowledge base is evolving here. And what's true today may not be completely true tomorrow. And it's probably going to continue to evolve. We saw yesterday the first couple cases uh, in two different parts of the world where people were reinfected with a slightly different version of, of COVID-19 genetically. So clearly, even though they had immunity to the first COVID they had, they were not immune to the, the second. And, and finally, on a, on a positive uh, uh, note, so, so evolution of knowledge. Most of the time, this kind of confusion and decisions goes on in the halls of universities and at journal clubs with fellows and professors talking about it. And now it's being discussed in the mainstream media, and, it, and it's very confusing. But on a positive note, you know, you've, you've all read and reported about the, the saliva test. Breakthroughs like that, if we're able to have a, a rapid saliva test that Yale has, has worked on in conjunction with others that's highly specific and sensitive and can be mass produced at a, at a reasonable cost, the ability to test people very quickly and very easily will make it mu much more easy to screen people and to cohort people and to prevent this from going forward, be it at a university, a community college, uh, elementary school, nursing homes, assisted living facilities, et cetera. So I think, I think there's a lot of hope, and I agree. I think that the governor's team have done a great job. Uh, I think we've done as well as anybody in the, in the country with a, a virus that we didn't know existed and didn't understand its uh, behavior. And I think we just have to continue to push forward. And as several of the speakers said, ask the, the students to respect one another, respect their professors and the staff, and follow the guidelines, not so much because they're at risk, but because many other people are at risk. And I, I think we'll be very successful, and I wish the, the students a, uh, a wonderful, wonderful semester, especially if most of the days are like this. They're not going to want to study very much, but that's, uh, that's how the fall semester usually went for me. So thank you very much. Thank you. Bill, thank you. Before I open it up for questions, I just want to make uh, a couple of more comments directed um, at students. You know, we're all here because we feel very strongly in our mission to educate the students, not only in the state of Connecticut, but those that come from other states uh, to get a high quality education here in our great state. And many in the press and elsewhere have dismissed your ability out of hand to be socially responsible as you return to campus. Not going to happen. The students have been cooped up since March. They're going to come back. They're going to go wild. I believe very strongly that the students from Connecticut and those that come into Connecticut will rise to the occasion and prove all of those naysayers wrong that they will wear masks, that they will physically distance um, where they need to physically distance, where they will not gather in groups that exceed what the governor's put out in terms of safely 
gathering inside or outside. So I think it's up to all of the students to prove everybody wrong. I believe in your ability to have a greatly successful semester. And so I wish everybody the best of luck as we open up today. And with that, I'll open it up to any questions that uh, folks might have for anybody here. Yes. Well, I think, I think um, a couple of things, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Tom, who's already had that experience. Um, but I think what we're trying to do is be very proactive initially about our message, about what it means to gather in a socially responsible way, what sort of the protocols are for doing that. Um, but clearly, if folks violate those guidelines, whether it's on campus or off campus, there are sort of actions that we can take um, to sort of minimize those activities, um, you know, including disciplinary action. So I, we don't like to lead with sort of the stick. Uh, I always like to lead with the carrot. Um, and we've embarked at all of our schools on a very ambitious social media campaign about what it means to be socially responsible when you, you return to campus. Um, but clearly, President Casaleas had an incident um, where he had to take action, which I support and agree with. So, uh, Tom, if you want to answer that. Well, I, I do think it's illustrative. Yeah, and we're approaching this with a combination of humility and determination, and our students are as well. So we did have a case of a, a small gathering after move-in in one, one dormitory, about a dozen students. And uh, the behavior in another year would have been considered uh, normal, age-appropriate behavior but obviously puts our community at risk. So very quickly, they, you know, they were sent home in order for the protection of the community. Since that time, the largest gathering we've seen is six people. Uh, so the students are very determined to keep the university open, as my colleague from the private said. Uh, they, they, don't, they want to stay well, and they don't want to go home. And so they've been generally very cooperative. The challenge we've had has been, uh, you know, with uh, containing quarantine, but it's, and it's been what uh, Commissioner Gifford said, it's the small interactions, not the large parties. We haven't seen that, I think in part because there's been a lot of publicity around that. You saw, you know, the students saw it, the parents saw it, UNC, what was going on in the large parties, and, and they don't want that to happen here. So I'm very optimistic about that aspect. I think our challenge is a different one. A letter of this past Sunday uh, sort of outlines all of the rationale behind all of those questions that you asked. Um, DPH is looking at the National Federation of High School Associations categorization of sports for the fall into lower risk, moderate risk, and higher risk. And we've been consistently recommending that the higher risk and the moderate risk indoor sports be deferred. So that, is, that was our recommendation in our first letter, it's our recommendation in our second letter, and that's likely to remain consistent.
I think uh, it, it depends. I don't think there's a, a clear answer to that question. We've seen some colleges and universities that have seen um, outbreaks within days of bringing students back to campus. Um, and uh, we haven't seen that uh, so far, but we, uh, so, you know, we'll know how the move-in and the initial uh, set of interactions goes. But at any time throughout the semester, uh, you know, if we start to see, uh, you know, students let down their guard and, and things start to change or increase community spread, uh, we could see that change on campus. So it's, we're in this for the long haul in terms of monitoring the numbers, keeping the lines of communication open, and following those guidelines we've been talking about. And Paul, I think it's not just the university or the college having a spike in cases, but as we've seen in Danbury, if a, if a university is located in a community that has an increase in the rates of infection, then those are the considerations working with the commissioner that we're going to have to deal with. Right. Well, I think, I think the budgets are going to be challenging, um, even if things go relatively smoothly. Um, as we saw when we had to pivot immediately over spring break and, and close our residence halls, um, we had to refund, at least in, at the four regional universities um, here in Connecticut, $25 million for a short period of time. That has a profound financial impact on the bottom line. Um, but I think what we're doing is we have been very sort of proactive and aggressive in our marketing efforts in terms of enrollment. And I think so far our enrollment projections um, are, are good. They are within uh, what we had anticipated. So that's the good news at our universities. This is, you know, nobody has a crystal ball. So we, we meet as a senior team every day. We have like a crisis center out of my house virtually. Um, and we talked to the university presidents um, a couple times last week and, and, and as, an, uh, as, you know, as we need to. But I think the big thing is going to be if we can stay open and we can continue to provide residential services to our students, then I think the financial impact won't be as, as bad as it otherwise might be. Let me talk about the quality of the educational experience. Central have invested quite a bit in professional development for faculty. I can guarantee you that the online courses we are offering this semester in terms of quality and pedagogical approaches used by faculty are superior to any online class we have offered before. In addition to that, the technology we are using now, even for uh, online uh, offerings, it's superior than what we have used before. So we are looking at ways in which we can enrich the online educational experience by faculty, by including uh, the direct participation and engagement of the students during the courses. So what I am telling you is that we have done, from where I sit, an outstanding job with the commitment of faculty because they have been willing to be part of the process. They have been willing to be part of the solution and uh, develop themselves into better teachers. Uh, that's what I can tell you from uh, a quality uh, standpoint. From a financial standpoint, maybe uh, President Jacob can talk about that. 
Yeah, I, mean, I, I think the instruction that we're offering um, to sort of echo what uh, President Toro indicated is, is extremely high quality, is very robust, is very interactive uh, between faculty and student. As she indicated, we have invested a significant amount of mon money in technology. Many of our institutions had technology previously that we just upgraded um, a little bit. So we believe that the offerings are going to be um, very similar to uh, what was what was in person. Um, and at this point, we don't anticipate um, any sort of uh, financial modification based on an online or a high flex. And, and as President Toro indicated in her remarks, folks should come and actually look at what's going to be offered um, here on campus in terms of, of, of high flex options. Okay. So um, we're aware of the, of the modification and what CDC said about asymptomatic testing. Um, we are in touch with um, colleagues to try to understand the science behind the modification in those recommendations. For right now, um, if, you, if you actually read what CDC says, further down it says that uh, in addition um, that individuals should follow the guidance of their local and state public health officials. So we don't have any intention of changing our recommendations right now for asymptomatic testing. And as always, we encourage those who live in communities that have seen a higher impact of COVID to go ahead and take advantage of the uh, free testing sites that the governor has set up. And uh, that's what's worked in Danbury and we encourage people to take advantage of that even if they don't have symptoms. And in particular, there was something I wanna comment on in that guidance which said if you have a known exposure but you don't have symptoms, that you don't need to get tested, uh, we strongly encourage those with a known exposure to get tested and to quarantine for 14 days. Say the last part again. Um, you know, contact tracing depends on people picking up the phone when they see a CT COVID trace or their local health department or their local uh, student health calling. And it, it depends on them um, sharing who they have had contact with in the, in the days uh, prior to becoming symptomatic or having a positive test. So that information is private. It's not shared with anyone else beyond the contact tracing. So we uh, strongly encourage everybody who uh, receives a call to cooperate with the contact tracing efforts because that's how we're gonna contain the spread of COVID. If we see a case, we need to isolate the individual that has the case, identify their contacts and make sure that those people are both tested and then quarantined for 14 days. And that's how you stop the spread of an infectious disease. So I can't comment specifically about Hamden. Um, I, I can tell you that we have been working very closely with Commissioner Cardona and his team at, at SDE with the Office of the Governor um, to uh, help local health departments and school districts understand how to handle if they see a case um, in a school. And uh, so we'll be continuing to have those conversations and um, providing guidance and assistance when those kinds of things come up. Thank you, everybody.